called the Hare Krishna movement. We're trying to move the Hare Krishna all over the universe. Om Ajnana Timiranda Syaganangana Shavakaya Chaksura Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namani. Namaste, Sarasati Deve, Gauravani Pracharane, Nirvisesha Sunyavari, Paschacha De Satarane. Namo Mahabharanyaya Krishna Prema Pradayate, Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya, Namani Gora Tushenam. That verse is about Lord Chaitanya. We can talk about him as the main topic. He's giving freely Krishna Prema, love for Godhead, which is the topmost goal of human life, freely. Uh, special feature of this age. This age, we know from the general news, is full of trouble. But there's one very great thing, and that's just chanting the holy name of Krishna. And then, uh, Hare Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and he's the origin of everything. He's not an incarnation like some people think. And Lord Chaitanya is also not an incarnation, he's fully Krishna. There are many incarnations, unlimited, we can't know all of we know just some of the main ones. Vanchakalpa Trubhyas Cha, Kripa Sindhu Vyeva Cha, Patitanam Pavane Vyo Vaishna Vyo Namaha. We offer respects to all the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord who are just like desire trees and fulfill the desires of everyone. So I have to apologize, I don't speak Expreken Nick Deutsch. I took some Deutsch classes when I was in primary school millions of years ago. Never met a German-speaking person, <laughs> so I didn't practice and didn't remember anything. Uh, it's, it's actually a beautiful language, and it uh, is a source of English language. 
So I find a lot of Germans speak better English than me. But I just saw we talk about Lord Chaitanya and his movement. There's a Lord Chaitanya appeared, Krishna appeared 5,000 years ago and he exhibited many spectacular pastimes and killing spectacular demons, like much more than any superhero ever considered or any super demon that they make up in the movies, but uh, without any effort, without having to become powerful or anything. Even as a baby, he could take care of the troublemakers. That's his mission always, to help the devotees and annihilate the miscreants or the demons who are against spiritual progress, against anything religious. Now it's very common. The demons are more philosoph so-called philosophical, you know, atheistical philosophers. They're not, you know, big violent murderous demons or anything like that. But they're destroying the moral culture of the people with different philosophies, communism, and nowadays they don't even call it anything, but just all kinds of things to make people not understand who they really are. We're not these bodies. That's becoming a big mix-up. But we're spiritual persons. We're not, you know, not that I don't like, I'm, I'm in this body, people think it's a man body, but I feel like a dog, so I'm, I identify as a dog, or, or a monkey, or a woman, or whatever. It's completely un, un, can't happen. But next life it can. We're going to get the body that, you know, what we want. So we should be looking for liberation, for spiritual liberation. So after Krishna's appearance, then Kali Yuga started, the age of quarrel and distress, current age. 5,000 years ago, and it was progressing. So Lord Buddha had to come, and he promoted ahimsa, nonviolence, good behavior, you know, uh, but not, not godly, not, not an idea of the Supreme God or anything like that. And he got a lot of people to give up their violent types of activity, the animal slaughter, because they were, in the name of religious injunctions, they were killing too many animals. But then, that was, was like 3,000 years, Lord Jesus came and, you know, kind of uplifted another class of people, Muhammad, others come in India, many, different places, different types of great teachers come. And 500 years ago, Lord Chaitanya came. So his birth was very special. Nobody understood who he was. Right in the beginning they did, but then by his uh, mystic power, he covered over you know, the people, so they forgot who he was. They just thought he was a naughty. And he didn't act like a devotee at first. He didn't act like an avatar. He's called a covered incarnation. So many thought there's no incarnation in this age. Because he didn't come as a typical uh, incarnation that comes with weapons and, you know, destroying the armies of demons. He just came as a, acting like a devotee to teach us, especially to teach the chanting of the holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. I meant to mention, at the moment it just started, as far as I know, there's some sort of uh, all religious gathering. Some devotees are there, right? And all the different religions of Germany are coming, the leaders. And tonight, after everybody presents whatever they present, and, and 
their books or their, you know, whatever they're teaching. Then they have the music of all the different religions. But it starts at 8 o'clock and devotees will be there. Uh, so that would be very interesting because that is basically the tradition of every religion is music and dance. And that have been forgotten in many, many cases. They've become very, you know, serious. In the Christian church, I used to go and they would sing and I didn't like it, it was very really boring. But when I think back, they had some good songs, you know. But somehow I didn't like the presentation, you know, the type of music. Now modern churches, they use rock and roll and all kinds of things. And, and you get a lot of people. There's even a guy in New York, he's called the Kirtan Rabbi. Anybody heard of him? He wears a kirtan, plays a harmonium, and he sings Hasidic Jewish songs. And a, a lot of young people, they're dancing, and they go, oh, Kirtan Rabbi is ecstatic. And, and they've got a lot of young people coming back to the Judaism who had rejected it because it dried up. So Lord Chaitanya, he didn't reveal himself. He was very scholarly, he was the greatest scholar and logician of the time. No one can defeat him in any kind of an argument. But he went to, to Gaya, the holy place of India, where the Hindu children, sons go to worship and, and honor their father, their deceased father. So while he was there, he met spiritual master and he got initiated into chanting the holy name of the Lord and completely changed. And the teacher told him, you know, forget all this study, you know, you're not qualified just chant the holy name of God, which is the basic essence of, you know, all, re all religions. Even Islam, they have lots of songs, and Judaism has so many songs, Christianity, Buddhism, they chant the name of Buddha. Uh, not all of them anymore, but many, they chant in China, Nam Amitabha, Nam. They sit for hours and come early in the morning to the Buddhist temple and they chant. Japan also, not so many, but they do. And so he just started chanting and he, you know, he just went wild with that chanting and dancing and ecstatic and Every, you know, the devotees were very happy. And then later he was uh, traveling. And he met these, uh, we call Mayavadis, sannyasis. They're very, very strict followers of principles. And they just study. They sit and they study you know, so-called Vedanta. And he was singing and dancing with the other devotees and these big sannyasis, there were many, it's in Varanasi, India, and it's the headquarters, they were criticizing him. You know, he's a babuka, they call him, crazy person. And he's just, a, why is he a sannyasi? He's just associating with these crazy people that just sing and dance all the time, you know. And they don't know that that's the activity of the spiritual world. There's a verse in Goloka Prema, Goloka uh, Prema Ari Nama Sankirtan. Goloka comes directly from Goloka, from the origin planet of Krishna. It's Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. And so, he didn't associate with them. Uh, he wouldn't even eat with them. And then, but somehow, an arrangement was made by him that they came together and he went to their place. So, and not their place, but another house where they all were gathered. And he took a very humble position. 
he sat down and he washed his feet in India outside. And he sat down right practically in the foot washing area. And, but then he uh, emitted some effulgence, very bright. So they saw that and they thought he must be God. They, these sannyas, they think every, every sannyasi is God. You can, you know, they don't know what is the one supreme God. So they asked him, please come in the front. So he took, he, and then they were asking him, why you're, you know, you obviously so powerful and wonderful, and why are you, you know, associating with all these crazy people when you're just singing and dancing all the time? doesn't make any sense. So he told him how he'd met his spiritual master, and he told him, I, I don't know if they put that verse up, I, I asked, you can repeat, Hare Nama, Hare Nama. Hare Nama Eva Kevala. So that means the holy name, the holy name, the holy name. It's the only way. One certainly only you know, like that, Eva Kevalam. And then Kaloana Steva. Kalo means this age of Kali. Kaloana Steva. Not no other way. Kaloana Steva. Not another way. Kaloana Steva. Gatir Anyata. To reach the highest goal. So repeat that. Kaloana Steva. Kaloana Steva. Nasteva Nasteva Gatir Anyata Hare Nama Hare Nama Hare Nama Eva Kevalam Kalo Nasteva 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 Gatir Anyata And then he proceeded to speak and he spoke so brilliantly about chanting but also he defeated their godless philosophy perfectly and explained everything about their own teachings way beyond anything they'd ever imagined. So they all became like bewildered and admired him unlimitedly. So some of them took to following him. Then he left that place, but when he left, you know, by the time he left, everybody he was chanting. Then his friends were feeling much better. So that, that's the idea. And he traveled around India. First, he, 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 was, he lived in Jagannath Puri, which is a famous place in India. And many devotees go there, many tourists go there also. And famous temple, and then he left and he traveled in South India. He took only one servant with him, and he visited so many temples, I think six years he traveled around by walking, and every temple he would go, he would sing and dance for hours, and everybody would be amazed at, at this ecstatic, you know, exhibition dance. He was so graceful and beautiful. And uh, and they would start singing and dancing, Hare Krishna, and go back to their village, and they would still be singing and dancing. And then others would take it up, and gradually all over South India, people were chanting, he spread the holy name. And that's still going on. Uh, we've been doing it all over the world. Devotees in Germany have been going out chanting and dancing for so many, how many years, 50 years, and, and all over the world. And it's described in the, by Prabhupada's writing that this will spread all over the universe. And then he's, at the time that was, I don't know, 1976 or something. And, uh, he said, you might ask, how can it spread all over the universe? He said, the same way it's spread all over the world in 10 years, 
you know, one man in New York City getting a few, you know, ragtag, you know, uh, hippies or whatever they were, uh, to go and sit in the park with them and chant. And, and now in 10 years it had spread all over the world, 100 temples and devotees chanting on the streets. Of the, every city in the world for many, many hours it used to be because we were all young. I was talking to Bhakti Bhushan Swami, you know, we, everybody was young. Many teenagers joined, you know. I was 24 when I joined, I was old, you know. So many of the devotees that were there, they were still in their early, you know, 20 years old or even 17, 18, and in their dedicated life already. And we're chanting for many hours every day all over America, all over Europe, especially those two places. And then it spread to India and South America and, and much later to Russia and the Middle East, you know. In Eastern Europe, and it's still going on, spreading more and more here in every town and village. But there's a long way to go. But the holy name is quite known. People know Hare Krishna, and we can't really estimate the power. It's Krishna. Devotees are chanting in China. They're chanting in Africa. They're chanting in Japan. In Thailand, all these places, Buddhist countries, Muslim countries, so-called Christian countries, you know, everywhere. And it's, and the chanting has so much power, the proof is in the pudding, Prophet said there, George Harrison maybe said that, you know, you, devotees are giving up all sinful activities, meat eating, gambling, intoxication, illicit sex, everything, and becoming very, very happy. Uh, freedom, you know, these are called freedom, you know, freedom from all these crazy things. I know one devotee in London, he distributes many books, and I watched him one day, he'd hand the book and say, these are books about freedom. And people were naturally attracted. Then he'd say, freedom from birth, death, disease, and old age. And he'd say, <laughs> it sounds pretty good. Because that is our big problem, that's our problem. You know, we think there's so many problems, but the, the real problem is birth. What is the main cause of death? Right? If you look in the list, they would say, I think, heart attacks, right? Cancer, and I don't know what else goes down the list. I remember when it was so-called COVID, that was like number 20 or something, quite down. But, but cancer, heart attacks. But that's not the cause of death, that the cause is birth. If you take birth, according to Bhagavad Gita, you will surely die. Can't avoid it. And if you die, you're gonna take birth again. So, Krishna is saying, don't get too excited about it. And it's, it's a challenge, but we have to understand, you know, we're not the body. You know, we want to change bodies, but we don't want to have a different material body. We understand we're not, we're, we're in the body. The body doesn't die, it's, it's dead, it's never alive. It's just uh, like these machines. You know, it's a dead matter, but if you put the battery and turn on the switch, then something happens. It exhibits symptoms of life, you know. Wow. It has automatic, what do they call it? Inter artificial intelligence. Now I think it's even on the phone, some kind of AI, and you can tell it, you know, draw me a picture of a beautiful somebody and it'll do it. Write me a book about something. So. But it's not real intelligence, not real life. You can turn it off also. And somebody had to put all this information in. But the body is like that. We're living in the body, but the soul is so powerful that even in the body,
body of an elephant or a whale, uh, you know, or a big redwood tree that's big enough that they can put a highway through it and it's still alive. You know, cars are driving through in two directions. And I've been there, you can't see the top of these trees. And they're so huge and they're thousands of years old. But it's one soul in there making that grow. And the ant also, the soul, according to some karma with different bodies, even smaller, whatever bit me, you know, and then it was carrying something even more nasty, <laughs> right? Like I had malaria one time. I happened to be in Germany when it hit. It was hitting me in Africa, but I didn't realize what it was. I got to Germany and fell in a coma, and we spotted. So they, I was fortunate, and they had good doctors, German doctors, and they got me, kept me going. And, but that's just, you know, some microscopic thing. The mosquito is not very big, especially the African mosquitoes are very small. Here you probably have big ones, right? I grew up in Minnesota, the north woods of America. You know, they were huge. And they would sit there and suck up so much blood. And I used to watch them, they could hardly fly afterwards. And, but if they have malaria, the malaria is like, who knows, nobody knows what it is. And they can't find any anything to stop it or they can cure it but you know they can't prevent it they've been spending millions of dollars but it can knock out an elephant and you know tiny little things so small things count don't like that's what they say don't think your small effort you know if you're trying to serve krishna sometimes we think well i don't i shouldn't I can't do very good anyway, or I can't do very much, so better I don't do anything. Now everything counts. You don't know what one little thing you do, what big result it's going to have. You know, the smallest little thing can start an avalanche. You know, uh, everything starts small. You know, uh, and it grows. Prabhupada started very small. Everybody's probably a little familiar with our Guru Maharaj's mission, you know, he he's dedicated. We pray Namaste, Gauravani. He, he's he's uh, giving the message of Lord Chaitanya, which is chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, and dance. And, you know, whoever you go and whoever you meet, tell them about Krishna, tell them something. Show them the Bhagavad Gita, you know. Tell them you really like the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> tell them you like Krishna food. Go to the temple and take Krishna food. It doesn't, you don't have to know very much. Uh, sometimes we think we can't preach or somebody will tell you, you have to be a big scholar. No. Actually, that can be an impediment because people can't follow. Uh, in the very beginning in Los Angeles, our Guru Ranch Prabhupada, he was sitting with a few devotees, like five or six devotees, who had started a temple in Los Angeles. They were living in some garage or something. And he was, uh, he had, it was the birthday of his guru, and he was reading letters he was getting from the devotees as an offering. Then he asked the devotees one by one, you know, are you happy? Do you like being, a, you like chanting? And they all said yes. And they were very happy. And they were all very new devotees, nobody more than one year. And he said, so I, one thing, you just tell everybody, I'm happy, I like this. You don't have to know anything. He said, you, know, you don't have to be a scholar, you don't have to know anything. Just tell people, I really like this chanting. I really like this Bhagavad Gita. And it's very powerful. Nobody can argue with you. 
if I say this is the most ancient book and this is pure knowledge, everybody says that, why should I believe you? But if you say, I really like this, <laughs> very few people would say you're just lying, you just say that, you don't really like it. <laughs> Some people would say that. Now in America, when we approach people, most people would say, is it religion? And if you say yes, they run away. Any, if you say anything, but no, 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 it's spiritual. They, I want spiritual but not religious, whatever that means. And a lot of them are sincere. They, they do want spiritual, but they have no idea what is spiritual. The Bhagavad Gita is 100% spiritual. Chanting Hare Krishna is 100% spiritual. And we can enter into it by, this is called Sadhu Sangha, coming together. Krishna is very kindly arranged. There's so many of you here. It's really interesting for me because I go to Japan a lot and to find more than 10 or 12 Japanese together at a gathering is really big. <laughs> Even 10 or 12. Uh, they come very sincere, but not very many. They're, it's difficult for them. We go to China, then we have a huge gathering. Oh, in China, huge numbers. <laughs> they're, they're different. People think they're the same, but they're not complete opposite. But everywhere in the world, they chant. People, somebody takes it up. Somebody goes out and tells other people, please chant. Or they just chant and let everybody hear it. This is, you know, we're trying to save the world by sound vibration. There's so much pollution, air pollution, but the main thing is, is sound pollution. And nowadays with all the, you know, subtle sounds, all the Wi-Fi's and all the televisions and radios and, you know, internet, like zapping everywhere we go. Anywhere we, I sit in an apartment, if I turn on the Wi-Fi, I get like 20 or 30 signals. And, I don't know where they're coming from. I can't connect to any of them, but they're all somehow there, you know. I heard somebody took a picture, somehow they could take a picture of all this stuff in the room, you know. And there's just like so many lines everywhere, you know. So we need to purify that. But the Holy Name of Krishna can purify so much because Krishna is the source of everything. He's unlimited. So the more we chant, our own mind becomes purified, and the whole atmosphere around us becomes purified. The whole world becomes purified, even the whole universe. So Lord Chaitanya is, you know, doing that. So he traveled six years in South India, spread it all over, and he went to Vrindavan, back and forth, again walking, and he met those, you know, my buddy sannyasis converted all of them and it, it, very interesting he had uh, preached to one very big scholar the, the biggest my buddy scholar in the world at the time and he was you know he couldn't believe krishna is the supreme god he didn't have an idea of that and, Especially couldn't believe that Lord Chaitanya was. Because he, his studies showed there's no avatar, there's no incarnation in this age. So they were discussing philosophy. And this man asked him, explain one particular verse. Famous verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam called the Atmarama verse. And it's saying how, you know, the Holy pastimes of Krishna are so wonderful that even, you know, my buddies can change. And Lord Chaitanya said, well, you explain first. And I can't think of anything. So he explained in nine different ways, which no one else in the world could do. It was far beyond anybody's ability. And then Lord Chaitanya explained it, I don't think, 13 or 16 different ways, 18. And he spoke so brilliantly that this scholar completely changed. 
and said he has to be the Supreme Lord because no one else can talk like that. And he did it in an amazing way. He took every word and he gave all the dictionary meanings, you know, every word in a dictionary has many meanings, especially in Sanskrit. And then he explained, based on all the different meanings, combining them all in different ways, and just bewildered him completely. So that went on. Then many, many years later, when he was in that city that I was talking about with all these scholars, he was preaching to a, a devotee, and named Sanatana Goswami, who was also a big, big scholar, but he was a devotee, and he was very, very learned, and he was teaching him, you know, because he, he had recruited him to be a, he was such a great person that the Muslim king had forcibly recruited him into his service in the government. And then Lord Chaitanya went and recruited him to lead his movement and leave the king and lead his, his movement and write books and spread his teachings all over the world, which he did and made many, many disciples. And so um, at the end he told him, I heard that you uh, had spoken so wonderfully about this verse, uh, and I wanted to hear what you said. So Lord Chaitanya said, I don't really remember. You know, I was just talking. And there were two crazy people who were just talking philosophy. And I don't remember, but I'll see what I can say, maybe because, you know, if you have a very interested audience of any topic, you know, it's much easier to speak. So. Lord Chaitanya started speaking in the same way, but he went on in 61 different ways. And uh, the, the main disciple of this main Mayavadi scholar who was appreciating Lord Chaitanya, he happened to hear that. And so he was like totally blown out. He just, and he went and told everybody that he just explained this because these were great scholars and and they just never heard of anything like it so they came and begged him to please uh, the next day again repeat it all so he did say uh, somehow or other and then the, at that time you know he said chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. and the whole city this whole city of people who had totally rejected him and laughed at him and called him a bavuka fool and his singing and dancing. Everybody was coming to the temple and singing and dancing. Uh, and then he happily left. <laughs> so this is how he, it's still spreading. Prabhupada did it in New York, started with just a few people chanting in the park. When he first started, he sat down in the grass and the police came and said, you can't sit on the grass. So he moved over to the pavement. It was under a particular tree. That tree now has a sign, you know, Hare Krishna tree, famous tree. And I met one tour guide from New York. I met him a couple of times. He said he always takes his tour around past that tree and tells him this is where the Hare Krishna started. <laughs> and Somehow from there it spread all over the world. And devotees from this little group in New York went to San Francisco. And in San Francisco, that was a time when there were 100,000 hippies or something living in a small area. And many, many joined Hare Krishna. And then from there they went to Los Angeles and they went around America, many different places. And they went to Europe and Germany. I think Germany might have gone from New York, but and the Germans took it up very quickly. England took it up very quickly. Uh, Australia, especially those places, so quickly. So many joined and started chanting, and Hare Krishna became very famous all over the world. In fact, it became more famous in America 
when it hit London. That, that's when it got on the front page of the New York Times. Hare Krishna rocks London. Because <laughs> the Beatles were chanting. And uh, then they, you know, they worked for one year. They got George Harrison. Uh, and he got interested. And then he finally came out with so many songs, you know, with Hare Krishna. And amazingly, at that time in the rock and roll, and sex, drugs, and rock and roll, all these songs that were based on Bhagavad Gita and chanting the holy name of God became number one in the world for a long time. Especially my sweet Lord, you know, I was, you know, it was very personal. I want to be with you, I want to talk to you, walk with you. You know, and blow, nobody could believe it. Because even the mainstream Christians were not thinking of God as a person anymore. They're thinking as whatever they were thinking. Some kind of indescribable. They were so much influenced by this uh, impersonalist teaching. So the holy name is what's doing it. And we, that's why we're chanting here and we're requesting everybody to join us all the time. And we're very happy that these young people are becoming so enthusiastic about chanting and making beautiful music. I would kind of like to be there tonight, but they schedule something else. It starts very late, this music thing. But it, it's just a very wonderful thing, and it's a lot, it's just, you know, everybody's tradition, but I know we had a interfaith meeting in America a few years ago. They have every year, but one year the topic was the name of God, the holy name. And these other religions, they all had, you know, become fascinated to dig into their tradition and find out how much the name of God was the essential thing. <laughs> you know, they had forgotten that. They become like kind of dried up or ritualistic. We want to be careful about that. The main ritual is chanting the holy name of the Lord. Joyful, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, I think. They, we used to hear that in the Bible, you know, but we didn't really understand it. Sometimes we see that in America, the uh, Afro-American churches, they really dance and chant, and they really glorify God. Uh, and they really like it when they hear Hare Krishna. In Africa, we go by some churches and everybody, they're playing drums and organs and everybody's jumping and dancing for hours, you know. And that, that's a natural tradition of every religion. Muslims also have beautiful music. We, we had a program in Indonesia and the Muslim music, and it was whatever their religious music, it was so beautiful, the singing is really like charming. And the Christians also, you know, the Buddhists, everybody had their music, you know. We had a very simple song. You know, people ask us sometimes, don't you have any other songs? I told one man, yeah, we have a really lot of songs, but this is the best one. So we just sing this one. He said, and he said, okay, you know, that's a good idea. And we get many people in New York, we sit in the park and chant for four hours every day. And many people are watching. We try to approach and they, I just want to hear the music. Leave me alone. You know. Okay, good. Keep listening. You can join, you know, and sit down. And, and we get children to join. And you know, years ago when I first chanted in the street, Children always were attracted, and the parents would pull them away. And uh, then, many years now, the parents tell the children, go close and give them donations. <laughs> so it charms that, you know, music charms everybody. And spiritual music is, you know, what music is really meant for. Everything is meant to glorify the Supreme Lord and to glorify the spiritual world, the kingdom of God. So if you please read Bhagavad Gita, read our books, any of them, they describe what is the kingdom of God, what is the soul, 
what is our real nature? You know, we're not just not the body. We're not nothingness. We're not, you know, all one. We're not all just Kim Nero. We're all individual souls who have an individual loving relationship with Krishna, the Supreme Lord, and it's in service. We're always servants in this world. Everybody's a servant of somebody. Even the, in Japan, the traditional emperor, his, his position was a servant of everybody. There's one famous uh, business writer. He wrote these books, you know, the one minute everything. You have those in German? You know, the one minute manager, the one minute parent, the one minute teacher, the one minute salesman. And someone asked him, how, how do you know who's qualified to be the CEO of a big corporation? He said, when someone realizes that they are the servant of every employee in the entire corporation, and they can be the CEO. <laughs> Not that they think I'm the best, I'm the, man, I'm the master, I know more than everybody. When he thinks my duty is to serve everybody and help everybody else to do their work. So that's our business, we're all servants of Krishna. Servant of Krishna means servant of everybody because Krishna is in everyone's heart. So thank you all for coming and tolerating my talking. That was it's three, number 12 now. So if anybody wants to comment or ask a question, we'll take a couple minutes. And I don't know what's next in line. Yes, sir. Some my question is in the Gita, Bhagavad Gita, there's also Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and Today we see a lot of people doing also Ashtanga yoga, different kinds of yoga. What is the supremacy of bhakti yoga? So what is, um, well, the first six chapters are basically karma yoga, but bhakti is always there, right? You read? Bhakti is always mentioned, but it's not pushed ahead like the only way. Uh, so. Because Krishna is easing us into it. Prabhupada said that if Krishna would have said right away, surrender to me right in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, nobody would read it. <laughs> so we put it at the end. But uh, starting from chapter 7, you know, he gave so much. Uh, so I just, I was going to look it up this morning, but I didn't have the book. But. Chapter 6 is, uh, I can't remember the title, but the last verse of chapter 6 says, uh, Yogi nama pisarvesham madgatain antarataram saravan bhajate yo mam same yukta mato mataha. So, of all yogis, also all types of uh, abiding in me, always thinking of me, within himself, in full faith, renders transcendental service. One who, to me, he, by me, is considered the greatest. And Krishna is saying me a lot. Previously, he didn't say me. He'd say the Supreme Lord. And, you know, the ultimate, things like that, and the kind of impersonal words. And all of a sudden he starts saying me. And we read this morning this first verse, or last night, chapter 7, in one verse three times he says me, but sometimes much more. So it says, of all yogis, the one who with great faith, who always abides in me, thinks of me within himself and renews transcendental service to me. He is the most intimately united with me in yoga and is the highest of all. That is my opinion. So that's, you know, where it starts. Krishna makes very strong statements like that. So again and again, especially in the chapter 7 through chapter 12, you know, he talks about himself and many, many aspects of himself, how he pervades everything, 
always everywhere, he's in where someone's trying to worship anybody else, but it's really Krishna. And then in chapter 12 is all of this called Bhakti Yoga. Then again, he gets philosophical at the end, Gana Yoga. But at the end, again and again, surrender to me, and give up everything. Give up all the other kinds of yoga, all the dharmas, all the religious rituals and everything. You don't need that. You just chant the holy name, basically. So Lord Chaitanya started with that, chant the holy name. Hare Nama, Hare Nama, everybody. Let's get it together. Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Eva Kevala. Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Eva Kevala. Kalona Steva, Na Steva, Na Steva, Gatya Ranyata. Kalona Steva, Na Steva, Na Okay, that help? So you can read the whole Bhagavad Gita. You know, he teaches everything because it's all part of Bhakti. Bhakti doesn't, isn't, you know, exclusive of knowledge or anything. Like people think, oh, bhakti, you know, we get Hindu sometimes, you've heard that? That's for old women and babies, you know. I heard that from my grandmother, you know. We heard the Krishna, yeah, we heard about Krishna's pastime. But no, it's the ultimate. Other people learn from their child, you know, and they understand. There are lifetime Vaishnavas. But so that's the real point of Bhagavad Gita is surrender to me and it comes up a lot towards the end me, 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 me you find it how many it, it's quite amazing how how many times Krishna says me me means me mom means mine aham means I if you count how many times that's in the Bhagavad Gita and the Mayavadis say, it's not Krishna, something else. <laughs> he didn't mean that, no, he meant what he said. Give it to me. If I, if I say, give me the glass of water, and you say, well, I thought you meant to give it to somebody else that we can't see an invisible person and pour it on the ground. You know, doesn't make any sense, but that's what they're <laughs> that's what they're doing. And people like that, because if there's no Supreme Lord, no person, then you're free to do whatever you want. You just make up your own life, you know. It's crazy. All right, so who's in charge here? What's the next thing? Huh? Who knows? Archie? All right away? Probably. Everything's there, it's been there all along. They made an offering. Okay, so thank you very much. We have more kirtan. We want everyone to dance on. Right? Dancing with your hands in the air. It's stated that when the devotees dance, their feet purify the earth. And when they raise their hands, it purifies the heavenly planet. What to speak of purifying our own heart and consciousness, opening up to let the pollution out and let the nectar come in. So, you know, it's good exercise. So many exercise people we do, but if we dance and chant every day, 30 minutes or more, nobody will be, everybody will be healthy and strong. Okay, so, Danke, Dane. Still say that, <laughs> huh? Maybe next life I'll speak German or Japanese or Russian or Chinese, Hebrew. There's a lot in Africa. There's so many languages. Can't nobody knows. <laughs> but educated people, fortunately, speak English, thanks to the British. So they arranged to make it possible for Prabhupada to spread Krishna consciousness everywhere because he always finds somebody who could speak English and translate and somebody could read the books and translate them. So 
There's all kinds of arrangements been made for many, many years, and now it's spreading like faster and faster. And we just want to grab on to the, and be very serious. And you don't have to give up, you know, anything except sinful activities, and can live a perfect life. And by offering your work to Krishna, you can attain perfection. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Goranga. 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 Yeah, that means the golden body. That's another name of Lord Chaitanya. And it's the same as chanting Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. And so we'll have our chief now. Okay. So we ask everyone to stand up and dance and chant, hands in the air. So you get a good appetite because I think they made a feast. Right.